Hello, everyone. Uh, I don't know how well this mic's working or not. So, if anyone at the back can, anyone at the back hear me vaguely? No. Some people can. Some people can't. Some people are giving me thumbs down already. It's not going well. Uh, I'll try and just shout, but I've got a bit of a cold, so I may end up barking into the microphone, and then you'll all get deaf. So, as a nice starting point, I realise this is FOSDEM, so I automatically apologise for my Mac for <laughs> working for a company that's not open source and for helping other people to use Macs and install a bit of open source, but not enough. So I apologize in advance. Um, I'm not really sure on the makeup of people here. So first thing I'd like to ask is just a show of hands. How many people have heard of Homebrew, the Mac package manager? Oh, good, that's a reasonable number. How many people like kind of day to day are using Macs as their kind of primary computer things? Good, also quite a lot. Um, how many people are work on some sort of Linux package manager? Okay, I'm sure there's too much crossover there for that to be true, but I'm not gonna argue with you. Right, so I'll try and talk in this talk. Like in the past, talks I've done on Homebrew have been sort of a bit here's the basics of what Homebrew does, but because it's kind of the distributions room here, I thought people who kind of know and care about things like Linux distributions <coughs> might have some interesting things for me to learn, and I might maybe even have some interesting things for you to learn as well. So I'm going on the good, bad, and the ugly, and that's basically what I see as the things Homebrew does well, maybe better than some other package managers, I don't really know. The stuff which we kind of struggle with, and the ugly, is, well, partly because that's, you've got to name the talk that, right? But also, like, that's the stuff I personally find is kind of hardest in actually keeping the project running. So, my name's Mike McQuaid. Um, I work at GitHub as an engineer. Um, I've been working on Homebrew for about six years now. Um, homebrew and GitHub are fairly tightly coupled together, as you may have noticed. So, yeah, me working at GitHub is probably a result of me being a fanboy of GitHub for quite a while through using Homebrew. Um, you can see like my stuff and things on GitHub down there, and if you Google my name, you can find Twitter and all that type of nonsense as well. Feel free if you have any questions during or after the talk that you're not happy to like raise in front of everyone else, feel free to just send me an email. And then equally, if there's anything that you feel is worth interrupting the talk, please feel free to do so during it as well, in case I make some glaring omission or whatever. Right, so things I think Homebrew does quite well. Um, actually, another show of hands. How many people in this room have ever submitted a pull request on GitHub? How many people in this room have ever submitted a pull request on GitHub to Homebrew? I love all you people. You're all wonderful. So, one of the nice things with Homebrew, um, which we've just got from the virtue of GitHub rather than any sort of merit of our own, is that it's very, very easy to contribute to Homebrew, relatively. So you just make a pull request to the project, you edit a file, we run CI, and then if it's green and it looks good, then someone will merge it. So as a result, we have, which is not bad for a project that's kind of seven years old, I think, we've got you know over 4,000 unique contributors, and that number is just going up and up. Um, people are almost on a daily basis, we're getting new people who kind of, their first foray into open source development is, I want to use this particular piece of software, I want a slightly newer version that's what's provided in Homebrew at the moment, so they can just basically get the software, find the URL, bump the version in the URL, download it, update the SHA-1, create a pull request to Homebrew, and then that will probably be merged, hopefully, if it's non-contentious in 24 hours or less. So we like to think of ourselves as hopefully giving a reasonably nice, very, very easy way of contributing to open source for people. And then if you see, start to see the na same names kind of pop up again and again, then I'd start to try and push people a little bit harder, maybe say, oh, well, while you're in there and changing the version, maybe you could do some cleanup, maybe you could write a test, maybe if you've kind of run across some problem, then you could kind of submit a pull request for that, and just generally try and nudge people gently in the right direction. So Homebrew itself is run day-to-day -day pretty much only by six people. There's only six people who have commit access to 
well, and actually use it to the homebrew repository. There's two or three others who aren't listed there who are kind of currently on leaves of absence. Um, but we have no formal hierarchy. We don't have any one person who decides whether stuff gets included or not. It just ends up being a combination of discussion and also the kind of relatively nice open source principle of if you're the one willing to invest lots of time and energy into doing the work, your opinion counts a bit more than someone who just comes along and says, you should do it this way, bye. Right, so you're definitely not going to be able to read this, but basically our contribution model is around, as I said, these six people are the only people who have actual commit access to the repository. So basically everyone else goes and forks the repository on GitHub, makes their changes there, creates a branch, hopefully, and then creates a pull request, and then we can then pull those changes in one of our six into the main repository. So an average pull request might look something like this. We've got, like I submitted this pull request myself, even though I have direct commit access just because it makes it easier with some other things that we do, which I'll come up on later. So it's the cute cryptographic architecture, I think. I can't remember what the last bit stands for. Just a new version bump, closing some issues where people have requested this already. You can see my commit there, and then the commit pull request is referencing itself, and then I close the pull request from the commit. We don't use the home, uh, sorry, the GitHub like clicky merge pull request button because we like to have our history nicely just cherry picked Git commits rather than lots of squiggly mergy lines. I wrote a book on Git, so I have like feelings about weird things like merging. Um, so this is kind of a relatively typical pull request. Like often there will be no communication at all. I'm trying to get a little bit better about thanking people, particularly first time people, so it's not just like, oh, like you just merged my thing and didn't talk to me in any way, that's a bit weird. But yeah, so when things go a bit wrong, that's something we've kind of built upon in the last year. In the last, I think it was about a year and a half ago, uh, maybe two years ago, our current kind of situation, it was the same with pull requests, but the problem was effectively we would have to just, if you want to test a pull request, I would need to download that package onto my machine, the changes that they'd made, and then I would need to manually run the compilation of that. So in, in the case of some packages, you know, if you're building, I don't know, something like Qt, even on a fairly fast machine, that's going to take 45 minutes. So that became a bit of a barrier in the kind of contribution process because it would rely on the developer having enough time for the machine's fans to whir away for 45 minutes before they could kind of check these things were working the way they wanted them to. So we did a Kickstarter, we raised a bit of money, and we bought some like physical hardware which is sitting in a, a data center, um, kindly donated to us by Positive Internet, um, and not the entire data center, but that would have been very generous. Um, so now what we have is when you submit a pull request to Homebrew, we will notice that, our bot will notice that pull request using kind of Jenkins in the back end, and we'll then download that, test it on the three versions of OSX we support, which are the current version, uh, OSX 10.10 .10 Yosemite, and the previous two, Mountain Lion and Mavericks. Download it, run, initially would basically just run compilation. Now we kind of run a few more things. We run the compilation, we run tests, and we install all the reverse dependencies to make sure that you've not accidentally broken something with one of them as well. So the nice thing about this process now is you, it integrates nicely with GitHub's kind of continuous integration stuff, and you get a nice green or a nice red at the bottom of the build, basically saying what went wrong. So if, if there was a build that failed, and you clicked through and it was red, you might get something that looked a bit like this. Basically this is saying this package Y3, we ran brew install on Y3, and it failed on all platforms, Mountain Lion, Yosemite, and Mavericks. So you can click through and see the logs and stuff like that if you want to. And the nice thing we found with kind of the contribution process being so relatively simple, once you add CI into the mix, and decent CI where people get feedback, it's nice because we might have a situation where all the maintainers are sleeping, and you wake up and you find that someone has made a commit, made a pull request, pushed it, noticed that it failed, iterated on that, noticed it failed again, iterated on that, and then you wake up to a green build, which I can pretty much, because I believe in the principle of false uh, negatives rather than false positives, if it's a green build and the diff looks good, I can just pull that straight away without any testing, which is great. 
So another thing that we're blessed with in homebrew land compared to what I like to think of as real packagers in Linux land is we have minimal influence on actually breaking the system. With homebrew, you're installing you know, a version of wget or a newer version of curl or some little developing utility. We're not installing the system C library. So as a result, we don't need to worry as much about accidentally breaking the user system because you know, we installed a C library but then revisioned this package correctly or whatever. Because Apple supplies a reasonable number of increasingly outdated open source libraries. <laughs> but one of the nice things of that on the flip side is kind of homebrew's ethos there. Now, you can kind of debate the virtues of kind of homebrew versus Mac ports, but an, an example would be like the Mac ports, this is probably really old, but a package descriptor. So these are some of the dependencies that the Mac ports Git has. So you need to have all this stuff installed if you're installing Git. Whereas the homebrew version, there aren't actually any dependencies because everything that Git needs is shipped by OS X. So instead of saying, we're going to mandate that you install our special version of rsync or whatever, then we just say, well, if it stuff's provided by the system, then we can use that instead. And generally, the kind of slightly nicer thing we get from that, as I mentioned before, we don't need to worry about borking system stuff because we're not actually installing it. But also, generally, we get slightly faster install times. We get kind of more, more integration with the system and generally a kind of more, I would consider, more mac -y way of doing things because we try and hook in as much as possible to what Apple has provided us with rather than doing all our own stuff. So we still will ship an open SSL that's ourselves. Open SSL is an unusual example in case, and that's a situation in which we are always trying to push people towards using R1 rather than the system one because the system one has been deprecated and there's an old insecure version. Um, but most other things, we might provide duplicates of that system package, but we try not to mandate them on users because it just makes things a little bit slower. So another thing, like a personal peeve of mine and something I've been trying to push for uh, quite heavily in Homebrew is minimizing patching. Now package managers in general, I think, sometimes get a fairly mixed rap from like upstream developers because when stuff breaks, we have much to be unknownness for upstream developers. When stuff breaks, a lot of the time people will not go to the upstream developer and say, this is broken. They will come to Homebrew and say, this is broken. Even when a lot of the time those bugs might be relating to just a bug in the upstream package and have nothing to do with the way it's been distributed by us. So generally, the, the reasoning a lot of the time around package managers has been, well, if we have these issues, we'll patch them and then you know, we can continue to do this. The problem with that approach I found long term is you end up with patches which you don't really know why they're there anymore. They're not really needed and you know, they maybe were needed for some older compiler version or library version or whatever, but because there's not the same incentive to remove patches as there is to add them, i.e. the build breaking, they just stay there forever. So what I try, I'm trying to do in Homebrew and I've been trying to do for a while, cool. My microphone is too close to my mouth. Oh, close to my mouth. Okay. I will just speak into it like this. Right. Um, so this is a, I'm sad to say, boilerplate message. I've got quite good at writing boilerplate messages using like a little tool called Text Wrangler with Homebrew. So I apologize if you have an interaction with me on a pull request. Like there's probably a 95% chance now it's just like an auto-generated response that. I have typed three characters into my keyboard and it's spat out this expanded text. The, the good version of that is that it makes me significantly more polite because when I'm answering a pull request at like three o'clock in the morning and I can't sleep, I'm not like, oh, why didn't you read the manual? I'm like, oh, I've noticed that you've not quite read this. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, so <laughs> auto-generated me is far more polite than real me. But so this is some common blurb I try and say on Homebrew now whenever anyone submits any patch. So please submit it to the upstream developers. Again, you would think that that would be relatively obvious, but sadly, again, particularly on like platforms like OSX, which aren't as widely used, they have, I think Dbus was an example, and I don't think there's anyone particularly to blame for this, but Dbus on OSX for about four years 
there was just this massive like thousand line long running patch set which you needed to be able to run dbus and it had been submitted to the upstream developers but never merged because no one had kind of got involved with the back and forth process in trying to actually get that merged so the first thing we try and do is push people to actually submit patches upstream because then at least we know they're like they're documented somewhere other than in our source code and then we try and add a link to the upstream patch submission so we can actually keep track of that and hopefully if upstream either say this patch isn't needed anymore or this patch breaks stuff or whatever then we can then pull things and update it and an explanation of why the patch is needed again you would be surprised how many conversations this solves where someone says my particular esoteric use case i need to apply this weird patch and you say actually like you're calling it with the wrong arguments or whatever like you generally i have st relatively strong opinions about as package managers we should be trying as much as we can to distribute the software that upstream give us and if upstream give us crap software we should not just try and patch it constantly to try and make it good that's not really our problem at that point which brings us nicely on to the bad um so the most common annoying thing we get sometimes is upstreams who would not have been accepting of my apologies for my mac um, they would have probably hurled rotten fruit at me and you get some people who work on open source software who really really don't like macs they don't like mac people they don't like clang they don't even like apples anymore um, and it's quite hard working out how as an OSX packager you deal with that situation where this piece of software does not really work properly anymore we need to patch it and then upstream says I don't want your filthy patches um, so what we've been generally trying to do on this depends on the popularity of the package if it's something really really popular if tomorrow the you know GNU maintainers of WGET decided they didn't want to maintain OSX patches anymore well probably there's enough people using it that the patch is going to be well used and well tested and enough people want WGET that we just need to suck it up whereas if it's some really obscure little program my temptation is nowadays if upstream say we don't want to support OSX then we just kill the package and we don't ship it anymore because again as I say I'm not really in the interests of homebrew effectively forking half the packages in this situation in order to provide OSX support because then we end up with horrible long patches and everyone cries so the other relatively common problem is that upstream is active is inactive so I I go and post my nice little auto generated thing in the previous one and someone says well I have submitted to upstream but their git repository is not in fact a git repository it's a CVS repository and it hasn't been updated in 35 years <laughs> um, and at this point you have a bit of a dilemma because it's like well this pat we we have notionally submitted this upstream but realistically this is never going to end up in a released piece of software and again I try and apply the same principles where if software is no longer maintained if it requires increasing number of patches to be even functional at some point we need to say let's not package this software let's try and shunt people onto something else or just let them cry um, if anyone has solutions I meant to say this before the bad point um, please in the question time if anyone has any really obvious solutions to these problems I'm bringing up please let me know because I'm sure there are some but I'm missing them right uh, the other one is niche projects so as a downside of our relatively easy contribution model we I, I don't imagine massive distributions like Debian get this problem as much but we literally sometimes have people saying hey here's this project I've made on github in the last two hours like the commit history is two hours old um, no one else has ever used this software it has no readme it has no home page it has no documentation it has no help flag but I think you should add it in homebrew um, and we have like a thing in our documentation about saying you know please use your discretion when submitting things we may not accept everything that you submit um, and invariably these things turn into like massive discussions about why I'm basically Hitler because I won't include this person's package that they wrote two hours ago and who am I to say that there might be bugs there almost certainly isn't any bugs etc etc so 
we have to kind of work out a balance on this stuff. Um, and bizarrely, it ends up happening with some fairly major packages as well. Like a recent uh, kerfuffle was about, there's a fork of Node.js called IOJS now. And people got very, very upset because it was a week before this pull request got merged. And although this project isn't niche, it's not being widely used, certainly not widely used in production yet. So I think the flip side of a contribution process where we're kind of quite quick to turn things around is that sometimes you end up having unreasonable expectations on you where you're literally on holiday and getting abusive emails about, why haven't you merged this yet? It's, well, I don't even have internet. Like, I'm receiving this on a cafe on my phone. Um, so, again, I'm not sure on a, of an obvious way of solving this problem other than just having to tell people to go away sometimes. Uh, and the last one, I guess, is money. So, Homebrew, there's been some kind of really great talks today I've heard about setting up proper kind of charitable organizations and stuff like that for open source projects and getting kind of donations and sponsorship and things like that. And I think we need to do a bit more of that. Previously, our money situation has just been, we ran that Kickstarter, we bought that hardware, and we have some money in a bank account in the UK, which is kind of under Homebrew's name, thankfully, rather than mine. Um, but unfortunately, because there's just a big pot of money and we don't have any regular money coming in, stuff like our binary package hosting, which is provided freely by SourceForge at the moment, that's been a little bit unreliable. So we, we look at alternatives and all of them cost money and all of them cost regular monthly outgoings. And I'm nervous about signing us up for something where we have like a you know, 12 month, 18 month runway before all of our binary packages will just break because we don't have any money anymore. So it's kind of tricky when all of us as maintainers do not want to kind of pour our own money into the project, but yet we have a reasonable number of people using it. And again, I'm sure if we set up a, a sensible way for people to be able to donate, then people probably would, and this would be a solved problem. But generally, dealing with money is far more scary than dealing with software. So I just try and mooch off free stuff whenever possible. And onto the ugly. And actually, there's only really one thing in the ugly section um, in terms of stuff that we kind of struggle with on the project, which is kind of abuse. It, it's kind of bizarre. I'm sure I'm far from the only person to have discovered this. But when you run an open source project, you attract all sorts of interesting people, some very lovely people, and some strange people. Uh, some, some of the strange people, one of the previous mentioned ones where I didn't include someone's project because it was like two hours old, um, someone followed me on Twitter for an entire year because I went back and looked through my email logs to see when the following things happened. Followed me on Twitter for an entire year just to wait for me to have a bad day and then go and, t and tweet about like, oh, I'm having a bad day today. And I'm going, ha, 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 you deserve it. You're a dick. <laughs> <laughs> and it took me a while to work out who is this person? Why, why are they saying? I mean, obviously, it's the internet, so people say this type of stuff all the time. Um, and also, my friends say this type of stuff to me all the time. So it was like, what? well, I don't know you. How, where does your name come from? So I went and did this little detective journey and found out that it's just someone whose pull request I closed. And then he followed me on Twitter for a year just to try and stick the boot in when I'm having a bad day. <laughs> Thankfully, I'm a lucky enough person that actually, that actually made it a really good day for me because I was like, this is kind of funny. Ha the length to which people will go to try and annoy you. <laughs> but yeah, like this general, like Twitter, it's one of these weird, like I, I love it in many ways, but then I disengaged with almost all attempted open source discussion on Twitter because it ends up resolving into just people throwing names around and getting upset, and that's just me. Um, but it's, my attitude has kind of been, if stuff's important enough, it will end up on the issue tracker or it will end up on our mailing list. And trying to sort of stick out of the bike sheddy, this is why homebrew and everyone who works on it is really terrible. Because, again, I'm, I'm open to solutions on this, but it's surprising, I think, how much you can have lots of lovely comments from people and then someone making horrible comments to you just for like you know a few hours or whatever can really, really sap your motivation. And what I've tried to do with Homebrew is trying to protect 
um, our maintainers from that. We have a code of conduct that we try and enforce relatively strictly because my attitude is ultimately your pull request may be important and it may be good, but if it stops one of the maintainers who spend a lot more time working on homebrew from working on it because you've been really demotivating to them, then that's probably not worth the kind of loss to the project of you winning this particular fight. And again, we end up having some bizarre situations sometimes where, again, I'm sure this is a relatively common package manager problem, where people say, you know, in the backdrop of Heartbleed, the SSL v3 vulnerability, where people come and just submit a pull request that disables SSL, SSL v3 on OpenSSL. And that's all very well and good, but it then breaks Python. And you say, oh, well, it breaks Python. You know, what should we do about this? And they say, well, that's not my problem. You need to fix this. You know, SSL v3 is broken now and whatever. So kind of this balancing act of trying to do the right thing whilst having a life outside of just working on homebrew is something I've personally struggled with and yeah. So hopefully this has given you some sort of vague rambling overview of what I think homebrew does well, what I think I don't do well and what I think could kind of be learned from home, homebrew could learn from a lot of other distributions I think. Um, so I'd like to kind of open up if anyone has any questions or thoughts or comments then that would be lovely. Thank you. Yeah, I, and we do try and do that, but the, the sad reality is that well, people, it's yeah, it's kudos and it's, they're like a second class citizen now. There's an extra step involved or slight more characters in the command or it doesn't show up in search or whatever. Yeah. Like, so, yeah. Great. What was that, sorry? Yeah. Uh, yes, so that is a, an interesting segue, I guess, in the, the way that Homebrew installs packages. We install everything into a, rather than installing everything into like the user prefix or whatever, we install everything into user local, and then within that, every package has its own prefix. And then we symlink things back. So if you install wget, say version 1.00, it would be user local, seller, wget, 1.00, and then those links would then get kind of symlinked back. So if you try to install everything, it would all install nicely into their little prefixes, I'm sure, and then some things might if we don't have conflicts declared that should be there, then some things might break in that way. But yeah, I, I haven't tried because my hard drive cries when I think about it. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be a nice idea, I think. Um, and in some ways, I want us to go more towards that. Like something I would like to try so the way like your kind of GUI applications on OS X, like dot app bundles, um, the way they work is if they have library dependencies, they all ship all of their library dependencies inside everything. So you may have you know, 20, 30 versions of the same library in your system, but you can still get any app bundle and delete it, and it just doesn't care that you have all those duplicates. So in some ways, I would like to see us move a little bit more to that model where package management becomes a bit more about the individual things you want to install and not managing the complex dependency trees and things like that because that's A, the hard bit, and B, the bit where it all goes wrong. So yeah, in some ways, I would like to see a move for us more towards being able to just install potentially everything if you want to. Thanks. Yeah.
Yeah, we have actually. That's a, a really good question. Um, so the, the issue of I've had with mirrors is trying to find a primary mirror. So I've got loads of people, who, loads of organizations who've signed up to become secondary mirrors in which they would R sync stuff off the primary mirror. But the problem is finding a primary mirror which someone will provide to us hopefully for free with the bandwidth constraints that we have and being prepared to be the primary mirror in a rotation and stuff like that, that that kind of then gets a little bit harder. And then also the way that we annoyingly distribute all our package descriptors are on GitHub rather than on the binary package mirror, partly for security reasons. So then that becomes a nightmare to try and do geolocation and things like that. So yeah, basically we've considered it and we're trying to work something out there, but it's not quite there yet. Yeah, that would be great, actually. Let, let's talk afterwards. Any other questions? Oh, yep. Yeah, you end up with stuff being So our, our dependency system in Homebrew is like not very nice, and that's a bit of an understatement. It's, Homebrew is a great project, but it's one in which the initial implementation left quite a bit to be desired, and in the desire to not break things for users, we are very, very slowly trying to refactor the dependency system towards something sane. So when that is finished, which it will be at some point in the next 100 to 300 years, um, Everything will be magic and rainbows will shoot out your computer. But until then, yes, like the uninstallation is not as nice as the. So there's one command called brew leaves, which tells you effectively the end of each branch. So if you install one package and it installs 10 dependencies, it will tell you what the packages are that have pulled in the dependence. So that can help with uninstalling stuff. That if there's something in there that you didn't install yourself, then you can probably remove it. But it's not a nice solution, I realize. No, go for it. My <laughs> top five brew installs. That could be a BuzzFeed article. Uh, I, I like ACK, which is like a kind of grep on steroids thing for searching all over the place. It's very good. What else do I like? I don't, I don't even know. Uh, I like color diff and color grep. Sorry, color diff, which shows me my diffs, but with color. Um, I also like, I don't know, another, th another three things. <laughs> more, more software, but ACK is the main one that really exists. Well, and Git, I love Git, obviously, so I like to have the newest version. So how do we determine what we host as binary packages? No, basically it's done on kind of a case-by-case -case basis. We're slowly trying to build up the number of stuff, the number of things we have as binary packages. We don't have a sort of auto-magic binary. Well, we, we've got binary building stuff, which is all quite magical, but we don't have the facility to just say, you know, build binary packages for everything. Um, so at the moment, it's basically just on case-by-case -case basis, pretty much. But we are trying to, again, my goal is to have binary actions for everything. But yes, well, I think that's us. I have had my final sign put up. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming. And thank you for the questions. And thanks. <laughs>